In our study of the rate law, we found that reaction rate is influenced by the amount or concentration of reactants available to react. There are other factors that can influence reaction rate as well. In this lesson, we'll examine those other factors and how they can be related to the rate constant K. The four major factors that can influence reaction rate are concentration of the reactants, temperature, the phase and mixing of the reactants, and the presence of a catalyst. As we already know from the rate law, increasing the concentration of reactants generally increases the rate of the reaction. It turns out that increasing the temperature also increases the rate. In fact, there's a chemist rule of thumb that states that every 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature doubles the rate of most reactions. The phase of the reactants and mixing also influence rate. In general, reactions that occur between gases and molecules or ions in solution or in the gas phase overall occur faster than reactions between pure solids and liquids. And this is because these particular phases promote more mixing of the reactant molecules and more collisions that can lead to the product formation. Other factors that can influence mixing include things like the surface area uh, available of a solid or the uh, actually physically mixing your reactants together in a solution. Finally, the addition of a catalyst can also speed up the rate of a chemical reaction. Now, all of these influences are incorporated mathematically into this rate law. And reactant concentration, of course, is directly related as one of the terms in the rate law itself. The remaining three influences are all incorporated into the rate constant K. So K is only considered a constant under constant conditions of temperature and things like phase, mixing, and catalysts. If you change these conditions, you change the value of the constant. So we'll discuss the influence of these last three factors in this PowerPoint. And we're going to look at the action of catalysts as well in a little bit more depth in a later PowerPoint. We can quantify the relationship between these conditions and the rate constant using the Arrhenius equation. Here, K is defined as the product of a frequency factor, A, times an exponential factor that is the constant E raised to the power of the activation energy of the reaction divided by the ideal gas constant and the temperature in Kelvin. Let's first look at the activation energy in more detail. This diagram is known as an energy diagram and it gives you a nice visual for the concept of activation energy. Here we have the potential energy of our reactants or products on the x-axis. On the y-axis is a measure of how far that reaction has progressed, with points farther to the left associated with our reactants, so A and B, and points farther to the right associated with the formation of our products, C and D. Now, almost every reaction has an energy barrier to overcome to progress from reactants to products. This barrier is the amount of energy required to start breaking chemical bonds in the reactants and start forming chemical bonds in the product. It's associated with the formation of an activated complex or transition state. And the height of the barrier is the activation energy. It's separate from the heat that may be released or required in the net process. That is your enthalpy change, delta H. So this is an example of an exothermic reaction where the products are actually lower in energy than our reactants and result in a net release of energy. But notice that we still require a certain amount of energy just to get those bonds broken and new bonds formed to get to our products. That is what activation energy is. 
So an activated complex is a high energy intermediate state where reactants and products exist with partially broken and partially formed bonds. It's very unstable and it doesn't last long, but it's the intermediate that must form during the transition from reactants to products. So let's look at an example. The reaction we'll look at is the formation of carbon dioxide from a molecule of carbon monoxide and molecular oxygen. So in order to form carbon dioxide, the carbon monoxide and the molecular oxygen have to collide. They have to get close enough that you can form a bond between carbon and oxygen and break the bond between the two oxygen atoms in the oxygen molecule. And during the transition, as they break one set of bonds and form a new one, the two molecules actually form one activated complex with partially formed and partially broken bonds. It's a high energy complex as the molecules are transitioning from stable reactants and more stable end products. Thinking of chemical reactions as the result of molecular collisions is a really useful way of understanding the factors that influence rate. So this is collision theory. And according to it, chemical reactions are the result of molecular collisions, but not all collisions between reactant molecules are effective at forming products. So effective collisions for a reaction occur when the molecules collide with two factors complete. One is that they have enough energy to overcome the activation energy and form the activated complex. The other is that they collide in the correct orientation to break and form new bonds. In the Arrhenius equation, the frequency factor indicates the number of molecules that approach the activation barrier. The exponential factor, which is the entire expression in parentheses here, represents the fraction of those molecules that actually have enough energy to make it over the activation barrier when they approach. The exponential factor when calculated is a number between 0 and 1 that depends on both the activation energy and the temperature. A reaction with a low activation energy that occurs at high temperature makes a small negative exponent and the overall exponential factor approaches one. In other words, most of the molecules that approach the activation barrier under these conditions have enough energy to overcome it and proceed to products. The end result, we get a higher value of K. If we go in the opposite direction and have a low temperature and high activation energy, the exponential factor approaches zero. This means we'll have a lower value of K and indicates that fewer molecules in the sample have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier. Catalysts are substances that speed up a reaction, but are not used up in the reaction. And they do this by lowering the activation energy, as indicated on this general energy diagram. Catalysts work by creating an alternative lower energy activated complex with the reactants. This lower energy complex is a little bit more stable and with a lower barrier to go from reactants to products, the reaction occurs more quickly. Thermal distribution curves can also help us see the influence of changing activation energy and temperature on the fraction of molecules that have enough energy to form an activated complex. So here we have two diagrams, and the first one shows the influence of changing activation energy on that fraction of molecules. 
with lower activation energy, more molecules have enough energy to actually form an activated complex. So more molecules are above the activation energy threshold. If you increase the higher activation energy, it's a smaller fraction of molecules. The second diagram shows two thermal distribution curves representing a sample of reactant molecules at two different temperatures, T1, which is lower than T2. And so we see that because the uh, peak of the curve representing that average kinetic energy is lower for T1 than it is for T2. And it turns out a small change in temperature can actually change the energy distribution of the molecule significantly enough at this upper region so that we see almost double the fraction of molecules with enough energy to overcome the activation barrier. That small change in, in temperature is as little as 10 degrees Celsius. Let's take a closer look at the frequency factor in the Arrhenius equation now. So this represents the number of collisions that occur with the correct orientation to the activation barrier per unit of time. And the frequency factor actually can be broken down further into both a collision factor and an orientation factor. The collision factor simply is a measure of the number of collisions that occur per unit time, and the orientation factor indicates the number of those collisions that occur with the correct orientation. So let's look at what we mean by having the correct orientation here for a collision. At the bottom, we see an effective collision between carbon monoxide and oxygen. The carbon collides with the oxygen or one of the oxygens on the oxygen molecule so that a bond can actually form between the two to make carbon dioxide. That's an effective orientation. In order for that bond to form, the carbon has to hit the oxygen. If the carbon monoxide molecule is switched though, as it is in this top example, that bond's not gonna form. Carbon doesn't get anywhere near the oxygen that it needs to form a bond with, so no reaction occurs. In general, the more complex the molecules colliding, the less likely they'll collide in the correct orientation for the reaction to occur. For most reactions, this is the case, and the orientation factor is less than one. And when this orientation factor is multiplied by the collision factor, it lowers the value of A overall, our frequency factor. And a lower value of A means that we have a lower value of our rate constant K. Now, you can counteract a lower orientation factor by increasing the number of collisions, increasing your collision factor. So there are several ways that you can increase the number of collisions overall. One way is to change the state. So gaseous reactions and reactions in solutions are generally faster because it's easier for the molecules to mix and to collide more frequently. Mixing your reactants well increases rates because it increases the frequency of the collisions. And increasing the surface area of the solid reactants can also help increase the frequency of collisions. Both of these pictures represent the reaction between solid iron and hydrochloric acid in solution. The products of uh, these reactants are an aqueous solution of iron 2 chloride and hydrogen gas. And it's the hydrogen gas product that we can actually see in these pictures that indicates the rate of the reaction. Here on the left, we have a lot of bubbles forming. You can see them here at the bottom. And the cloudy nature of the solution above the iron 
is indicates a, a lot of bubbles, so a very quick reaction. On the right, we do have some bubbles forming, but they're not forming as quickly. So the relatively clear nature of the acid solution surrounding the iron indicates that the bubbles are just forming more slowly. Now the difference between the two test tubes is actually in the form of the solid iron. On the left, our iron is present as a powder and powders have more surface area associated with them. They can mix more effectively with the solution all around each powder uh, particle so that you have more surface area for iron to actually interact with hydrochloric acid. On the right, the iron is in the form of a solid nail. And so only the surface of the nail is available for collisions with the hydrochloric acid. All of the iron on the interior of the nail is not available. Less surface area, less mixing, less collisions, slower reaction. So collision theory and Arrhenius equation give us a basis for understanding why different factors like catalysts, temperature, phase, and mixing can influence reaction rate from the molecular level. For example, catalysts lower activation energy, and as we can see from the Arrhenius equation, with a lower activation energy, more molecules have sufficient kinetic energy to form an activated complex to overcome the activation barrier. Increasing the temperature also increases the fraction of molecules with sufficient kinetic energy to overcome that activation barrier. And certain phases, the degree of mixing and increased surface area for our reactants can provide more particle contact which means more collisions between reactant molecules and higher reaction rates.